Let us turn to the book of Ephesians, the second chapter, Ephesians chapter 2. Now, we have been looking at this marvelous passage of Scripture, and we have noted that a man was declared by God as being unable to get himself out of his condition. He is under a power. It is a demonic power. A satanic power it is the spirit that now works in the sons of disobedience and we previously to serving Christ were just like anybody else we lived in the passions of our flesh we carried out the desires of the flesh of the mind we were by nature children of wrath our future did not look bright we were destined for destruction. We were destined for the wrath of God, the judgment of God. But God intervenes. And this is a marvelous thing that we find in this verse, Ephesians 2, 4. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, it is because God is merciful. It is because God loves us. That even though we were in that ugliness, that condition that is so well described in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. Even though we were in that condition, you have been saved by grace. And furthermore, you have been raised with him in verse 6 to heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So we spoke of this marvelous thing that God has done for us, that he has now elevated us to being in Christ. We now are hidden with him. We set our mind on the things from above. We look at the nature of God as revealed to us in the person of Christ. And this is what salvation is. Salvation is an infusion of the spirit of God into your heart. Second Corinthians chapter 4. God makes us alive in Christ Jesus. And he gives us a revelation of the knowledge of God, of the glory of God in the face of Christ Jesus. We now see God as he is. We see the nature of God. And now we stand with him in heavenly places. We now are recipient of these attributes. They have been infused into our hearts, the virtues of God. The fruit of the Spirit, those virtues that are described for us in Colossians 3, the love, the peace, the joy, the gratitude that comes from our heart, the grace, the mercy, the compassion that comes from us, having received the very nature of God into our hearts. And so we concentrate on the things above because we are seated with Christ above what is normal for this world. We're not just like anybody else. We're not like those in Ephesians 1, Ephesians 2, 1 through 3. We have been elevated to now show forth the glories of God. We are recipients of the glory, and now we are also transmitters of that glory. We are seated in heavenly places. He raised us up with him. But in the coming ages, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace. It is the superabundant. It is a heavy-duty grace. It is a masterful, wonderful, rich grace and kindness that has been shown to us. The kindness of God towards us. For by grace you have been saved through faith. Now the kindness of Jesus Christ is something that we see throughout the Gospels. Jesus Christ was always moved by compassion. And his kindness, it is the kindness of God that brought him to that cross. That brought him to sacrifice himself for you and for me. Jesus Christ is our example of kindness. And then let's go to verse 8 because here is where we left off. And verse 8 is a monumental passage in the history of the church. 
And there is so much to speak about when we come to this wonderful passage of Scripture, which is Ephesians 4, 8 through 10. And the passage tells us that by grace you have been saved through faith. This is how you have been saved. And so grace, charis in the Greek, is something that is spoken about throughout the New Testament. And so most of the epistles are introduced with this idea, grace and peace to you. Charis be upon you. Charis was a phrase that was commonly used among them. You are a people who are recipients of grace. And what do you need and want more in your life than grace? So grace is wished upon us. Grace is referred to in our prayers. May the grace, may the peace of God be upon you. We need to be recipients of that grace. And as such, we need to be actively responded to that grace. And therefore, we should be transmitters of that grace. We are to be gracious people. That should be something that characterizes us. We, first and foremost, should be people who demonstrate the kindness and the grace of God. We show forth His grace. We have been identified as recipients, and our life is about grace. We are gracious. We walk around with this air of grace in our lives. We are people of grace. You have been saved by grace through faith. Now there's great debate about this passage, mainly about camps who divide in the Christian life and who therefore, because of their theological biases, come into the text with presuppositions and ideas of how the ver verse should be interpreted. And so they would tell you that you have been saved by grace through faith and then the controversy comes in what follows. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. And so they would tell you that, some folks, that uh, the gift of God is in reference to the grace, the salvation as a whole. But they will tell you that faith is our own doing. Faith is, that's our part. And so you know, it is insulting to them to believe that um, the faith has been granted to us. But as you can tell right away, the passage says, following faith, this is not of your own doing, identifying the faith. It is the gift of God. So it defines faith as the gift of God. If you come into the passage strictly from a grammarian point of view without distorting the passage, naturally you say faith it's not your own doing, it is the gift of God, and it goes with the entire context of Ephesians 1 and 2, which remember, there are no chapter division. And what is God saying throughout these passages? God continually, repeatedly says that it is all for His glory. It is so that the richness of the glory of His grace would be magnified. So it would be counter to everything He has been saying up to this point, to say that there's something here that gives us credit. It goes with the flow of the passage that faith is a gift of God. Furthermore, if the grace is the gift of God, then that would be redundancy because grace by itself identifies itself as being something that you are not working for or doing. It is grace. Grace is grace. You don't need to further identify or further define the term grace. It is the faith. The faith itself, God says. It is God who has empowered us. It is God who has given us the ability. Remember Lydia. God opened her understanding so that she might be able to hear the things that Paul was speaking of and understand them. And so God is the one who illuminates the heart and God empowers us, infuses us to believe, to believe. It is God who began the good work in you. It is he who will complete it. So yeah, this is uh, something that we find throughout the Bible. Like for instance, if you go to a book of uh, Romans and we have explored this passage uh, before, 
And in the book of Romans, uh, in the third chapter, Romans chapter 3, Romans chapter 3, Romans 3 is where God basically declares all humanity under sin, beginning with verse 9. It says that everybody's under sin, everybody, the latter part of verse 9. You know, there's not one righteous. None is righteous. No, not one. In case somebody said, oh my goodness, what about me? I was not so bad. But I had a good understanding of who God is. I mean, I, I, I really had a good perception of God. No one understands. No one seeks God. Now look at verse 20. By works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight. And then in verse 21, but now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. Verse 22, the righteousness of God through faith in Christ Jesus for all who believe. Yes, you believe. Who believes? You believe. Who gave you the faith? It is a gift. It is a gift. Don't ask me how this works because I can't explain it. You know, if to us it might seem contradictory. I just say what God says. I'm not trying to fall into this camp or that camp. This is what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches explicitly that God is the one who saves us. But nevertheless, it is us who believe. And it is us who come. Who come to him. You don't need to understand everything in this world, just accept it. He goes on to say in verse 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift. It is a gift of God that anyone should boast. And it is through the redemption that is in Christ. It is through the fact that Jesus Christ bought you. He paid the ransom that was required to rescue you from your sin. It is the grace of God. God put him out there as a pro pro propitiation by his blood. He appeases the wrath of God that abides on you while you are outside of Christ. And it is to be received by faith, in verse 25. In verse 26, it was to show his righteousness at the present time, so that he might be the just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Then what becomes of our boasting? Can we boast? Can no. we say anything about us having anything to do with this? No, it is excluded. But what, but, but, but by what kind of law? By law of work? No, by the law of faith. For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. So clearly the Bible lays out the fact that you are saved by grace and that no one can boast. No one. It is the gift of God. And this is what Ephesians 2 teaches us. Now, even Erasmus, well, he was a Catholic, and he um, believed in all the ideas of the Catholic Church concerning salvation. And so he opposed Luther theologically in written form, and they uh, had a little battle of writing books against each other. And um, even Erasmus conceded that um, the text here and Ephesians 2 speaks of faith being the gift of God. And so many other great grammarians, Greek grammarians and theologians, they all concur the same. This is not your own doing, it is the gift of God. Now, going back to the history of the church, for some reason, mankind likes to get the credit. They just like to get the credit. And so throughout the ages, the church developed into a church that was work-based. And so the grace of God according to Catholic doctrine as it developed, because you see, the Catholic church is a very, very, very different animal. You just cannot say, well, this is what the Catholic is. The Catholic has been, and the Catholic uh, 
you know, was at the very beginning. You cannot say that because it's an evolution. It's a, it's a, it's a process. It's a process of maybe 1,700 years. And if, as a good Catholic, you want to trace it back to the very day of, uh, uh, of uh, resurrection, 2,000 years. And so depending on where you are in history, you have different interpretation, different view of what Catholicism is. Early believers began to use that term Catholic to mean that it was the universal uh, belief among Christians because that's what the term means universal belief and the universal belief had to do with orthodoxy because there were many ideas floating around that were counter orthodoxy the original doctrine of the apostles Gnosticism for instance the Judaizers developed later on into the Ebionites who were another heretical group and you know, later on in history, you begin to see, you know, Marcion and his heresies, and you begin to see, you know, different ideas of the deity of Christ. Of course, of course, then comes Arianism in the uh, fourth century. So all these ideas begin to develop that were counter what the apostles taught. So the Christians in these first centuries began to say, we are believers in the doctrine of the apostles, and this is the Catholic Church, the universal church, all those who truly believe this are the ones who come from the apostles. And so later on, the church begins to develop into a hierarchy. And as the church begins to develop into a hierarchy, then all of a sudden, they begin to get a uniformity of teachings that were counter apostolic teachings. Among these teachings was the idea that we had something to do with our salvation. And not only that, that the church as an institution has something to do with our salvation. And so the concept of salvation by grace through faith was absolutely eradicated. And through the ages, really, we find very little of that. We find Augustine, for, for, for instance, in the 5th century later on, about a century after Arianism, lived through Arianism as well. And, you know, Augustus, really lays out the foundation for salvation by grace through faith. But nevertheless, he was a member of the institution, the Catholic Church from Rome. And he was part of the Western Church because there was a Western Church and the Eastern Church, and they all tried to work together. And at that time, there wasn't a hierarchy as it is today, a pope who speaks for God. But, you know, there were different patriarchs who depending on what side of the world you were in, they believed that they had equal power and authority. But now you have a hierarchy, and these people began to teach, basically, that the church held the graces of God. And so, yeah, Jesus Christ died, and salvation is through grace, but now the church has the grace of God. It's like a, the church is a bank. And if you need money, you got to come to the bank. You need grace, you got to come to the bank. And if you're going to get the grace of God, we dispense the grace of God. In other words, the bank prints the money. The bank gets to tell you whether you have grace or not. And if you come to the church, the church tells you, have you done all these steps? Have you followed all these sacraments? Have you confessed to the priest? Did you do your penance? Did you do step one, two, three, four? If not, you are going to hell. You need to go through the steps. And guess what? If you go through the steps, we dispense the grace of God. Is that where you go to the confessional? Yes. All these ideas start to develop later in history. You don't find them in the apostolic early teachings of the church. It's a development. And, I, and then it got so bad because when man corrupts things, things get pretty bad. And so what happens? You get to the 16th century, and by that time, they're saying, look, there are people being held in, in purgatory, and they're suffering, and that might just be your mother. <clears throat> and here is Jim, you know, with a very little understanding of theology of, uh, of the Bible, because they don't give you a Bible to read it, and you can't even read it, because it's not even translated into your own language. So Jim is saying, my poor mother is in purgatory, man. I feel so bad for her. How, how do I get her out of there? And here comes this guy with this pamphlet saying, hey, forgiveness to all the purgatory. If you give to the building of this monstrous cathedral, and if you give so much money, this man on earth 
will unleash her so she can go to heaven. And this is what they start teaching. So give me some money and I'll get your mother to heaven, Jim. What a blasphemy. The corruption was so incredible at that time that uh, this is when the Reformation begins. And it begins really against the corruption. Luther was just sick and tired of seeing this and the indulgences, and he kind of opposed the whole idea. He opposed more than anything the indulgences. And then the theology be, be, became something that preceded that. And they start to look at the passages, mainly from Romans, and those passages we just read in Romans 3 were key in developing the mind of Luther. Swingley begins to teach also the Reformation and begins to preach about Salvation is by grace, through faith. And so we today are products of that movement that began in the 1520s. And we stand firmly that we are not saved by any work that we have done, that no institution can save us, that no man can save us, except the man, Christ Jesus, who died and paid for our sins. Amen. And it is by his grace. It is the gift of God. No one is allowed to boast. No one can say, but wait a minute. God chose me because God saw from way before that I was going to be good enough to choose him. No, the Bible says that you were in a condition from which you cannot get out of. You were under the spirit that now works in the sons of disobedience. You were following the prince of the power of the air. But then God saw that you were going to be good enough to choose him. No, but God, who is rich in mercy, it is birthed in God. It has nothing to do with you. It was birthed in God, but God who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us. He saved us by grace. By grace you have been saved. That is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Not a result of works so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship. What does that mean? We are his workmanship. It is God who's working in you, both to do and to will according to his good pleasure. It is God who begun, who began a good work in you. It is God who will complete it. It is God who is the author and finisher of our faith, Jesus Christ. Author? Before the foundation of the world. Finisher? He will complete it. He preserves you till the end. On your part, what is your part? Your part is to believe. Your part is to follow Christ. You make a decision. You make a choice to follow him. No one can deny that. You follow him. On your part is to persevere. On God's part is to preserve. You say, wait a minute. How does that work? Don't worry about it. Just believe it. You have to do it. But God is the one who's working in you, both to do and to will. So some folks might go the other side and, and say, well, you know, since God is doing it, I can't do it on my own. It's going to have to be God. So if I have to quit this habit, it's going to have to be God because I cannot do it on my own. Well, I will say that's another extremism. And that is outside of the Bible. These truths should motivate us. And that's the spirit of Ephesians. Ephesians 4 begins with an exhortation to walk worthy of the call to which you have been called. To which you have been called. To walk worthy. In other words, he gives us a volume of blessings in the first three chapters. This is all God. And then he says, guess what? Now it's your turn. Live up to it. Walk worthy. So we don't sit around and say, well, God is the one. This pietism. God is the one. He did it all. So I just sit here and I just cruise and hope that somehow God will make me better, a better person. In the meantime, you're stuck with this rotten human being. I mean, right? 
That's an extremism. No, you have to respond properly to the truth of God. So let's not play theological games. We take the Bible for what it says. We don't get to fall into this camp or that camp and play word, play games with the word of God. We take the Bible for what it is. You say, well, I can't make sense of it. Look at your little tiny brain and then look at the entire universe, how big, how vast, how great it is. And there's a God who lives outside of that space and that time and this majestic, wonderful universe. There is a God who is there and here and everywhere and sustains the whole thing by his power. And you have no ability to even think about that. You cannot even think about it. You cannot even make sense out of it. It is beyond you. A God who lives outside of time and space. A God who is the, here and there and everywhere. So we don't get to play games with God's word. Some things might just not be, might not fit, might not fit in our tiny little brain. We nevertheless, we preach and we believe the word of God in its fullness we are his workmanship we are created in Christ Jesus for good works that's why we exist we exist to be a manifestation of the work that God has done in our hearts even the works that God created us for he prepared beforehand it is God who's sustaining this whole thing. And he has a field for us. He has a harvest for us to partake in. Now, not only is God preparing the works, but God also gave us an example. Everything that we do is based on the character and in the life of Jesus Christ. Jesus gave us an example. He himself said so in his teachings. For instance, look at the book of John uh, the 13th chapter John chapter 13 and this is a monumental passage in scripture because we studied the book of John previously and we noted that uh, these last chapters of of the book of John are the very last few days of Jesus's life on earth and so here he's leaving his legacy for us here Jesus is leaving his most important teachings, that which he considered to be monumental in the life of his disciples, something that would impact them. He's teaching them things that are going to be foundational in the beginning of the church for each and every single one of those disciples who followed him. He's giving them the top of the list. And Jesus is celebrating the Passover. He's about to be arrested, and he, at this time, after the meal, Jesus, in verse 3, knowing, John 13, 3, that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garments, and taking a towel, tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a back basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. Now look at this passage. In verse 7, Jesus said, because Peter didn't want to be involved in that, like, oh, no, no, Jesus, you can't wash my feet. In verse 7, Jesus says, what I'm doing, you do not understand, but afterward, you will understand. So I know this doesn't make sense to you, but you will. You will. Now, we have to ask ourselves a question, did they? Did they? And they did. We see that in their lives. Verse 12, when he had washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, do you understand what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. Now, Jesus had warned against anybody else being called Lord, teacher, giving them great titles, Matthew 23, 
That goes against the spirit of Jesus. Jesus was saying to them, look, I am your teacher. I am your master. And I am a servant. The son of man did not come to be served, but to give his life a ransom for many. This is the son of God. If God himself humbled himself, Philippians 2, and became obedient to the point of death, if he did not think that holding on to deity was something he needed to practice, to engage in, but lowered himself to becoming a human being and paying for our sins, and then he lowered himself further, washing the disciples' feet. This is the most menial, is that a good word? Of all tasks. I mean, these people walked around in sandals, folks, in mud, in dust. Let me tell you something, there weren't any, any, there weren't any of those um, Thai manicurists running around, painting uh, toenails and uh, you know, cleaning them up and making them look really pretty so they look really great on those sandals. It was ugly business. To wash somebody's feet, that was ugly business. Especially these guys who were traveling all over Judea and you know, Galilee and Jerusalem and back and forth. And there's even speculation as to how far they went but that's another story for another day. But these guys walked and walked and walked, and here's Jesus washing their dirty feet. And he said, I am giving you an example. I am giving you an example. Now, the apostles were always fighting among themselves to see who was going to be the greatest because they didn't get it. Jesus says, you don't understand this now, but you will. You'll get it. You'll understand. In fact, if you turn with me to the book of Mark, in the ninth chapter, Mark chapter 9, in verse 33, and they came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, Jesus that is, when he was in the house, he asked them, what were you disputing on the way? What were you discussing? What were you arguing about? Verse 34, but they kept silent. They were embarrassed. They didn't want to say. For on the way they had argued with one another about who was the greatest. They suffered from this malady. Remember Peter and John, their mother came and said, who's going to be, can you make my son be on the right hand, my, and one on your left hand when the kingdom is established? Jesus said, huh, it's not for me to be doing this. And, you know, are you ready to suffer the, the kind of suffering I'm about to go through? Are you ready to be baptized with the baptism that I'm about to be baptized with? Death? Jesus is saying, you, you want greatness? You've got to go through death and suffering and pain before you get there. And he sat down and called the twelve and said to them, if anyone would be first, he must be last of all and servant of all. Servant. The word diakonos, diakonia. We get the word deacon. It's one who serves. It's one who serves. Remember that story in Acts 6? I won't uh, turn there, but I'll give you the story. You remember the story. The apostles were very busy. The church had grown. What were they busy doing? Serving tables. Serving tables. They're serving tables. They're servants. So here are widows, people who are destitute, people who have no money. The apostles are out there serving tables and they say, man, we can't even get to the word in prayer. So they appointed great leaders. Now you might think, oh, these guys are just servants, man. These guys are just servants. These guys are probably, you know, for a life they were janitors, right? That's what they did. So, you know, that's why they got chosen. No, no, folks. These are people who later on became great leaders in the church. These are people like Philip, the evangelist. These are people like uh, Stephen, who could not be opposed because of the great wisdom that he uh, had, so they had to kill him and stone him. These are great leaders. So the leaders in the church began serving tables. The apostles were servants. They were ser serving tables. There were no popes among them. Now later on, the church develops a hierarchy, and you develop this great man with titles, with pointy hats and everyone sees them and they bow down and they kiss the ring what is this 
Jesus says, don't even use titles in the indictment that he gave to the Pharisees in Matthew 23. Read it. He said, I am your Lord. I am your rabbi. I am your teacher. Don't call anybody else. You are all servants. How did we get up to this conditions of hierarchy of a church now that is the supreme authority and they have a supreme leader? This doesn't exist in the Bible. The apostles were servants. They served one another. Jesus gave them an example. And in all things, Jesus is our example. And so we as people have been called to follow Jesus, to be like him, to have humility and love and compassion and grace, to be servants of all. Now, what is our natural tendency? All of us. Our natural tendency is not to be a servant. You know, let me just tell you, we have to fight against this. I was kind of kidding with my brother over here trying to get, give me some praises this morning. But who doesn't like to hear that? Tell me how great I am, Jim. <laughs> tell me, brother. Tell me more. <laughs> yeah, that's me, folks. That's me. But you see, we got to fight against that. We have to fight against that. What am I? I'm a servant. Do I sit here and say, bring me the hymn books? No, I have to make an effort. My idea is to say, I'm over here teaching the word. You go get the book. It's beneath you. It's beneath me. Yeah. <laughs> no, my heart should be, I'm your servant. I'm here to serve you. I'm here to serve you. And believe me, it's a fight in the flesh because we all have a tendency to preserve numero uno, me. I'm the king. Serve me. But Jesus gave us an example, and he said, you follow that example. This is where our work begins. This is where our work begins. He prepared words for us to walk in them. Jesus is our example. What kind of an example did he give us? Read 1 Peter chapter 2, I believe it is, where, where, where Peter says that Jesus has become our example and he suffered to the point of death. So you also have been called to do the same. Well, since we're in 1 Peter, this, uh, this passage came to mind. 1 Peter chapter 5. So I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ. Who is Peter? By this time, he's at the latter part of his life. The great apostle Peter, he is the first pope. Hey, that's what they tell us, right? Peter is the first pope. All these guys should be kissing that ring and bowing down. He is the vicar of Christ. He is the mediator between heaven and earth, <coughs> Peter. When he speaks, he speaks ex cathedra. That means from the chair. When he sits on the chair, he exercises great authority. This Peter. Oh, let the earth bow down. Let the earth tremble. Here's Peter. That's what they tell us about Peter. Well, Peter says, I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder, elder and bishop, interchangeable terms used in the New Testament. It's an overseer and one who has become of age in the faith. So basically what he's saying is, look, I'm just one among you who has become of age in the faith and who has oversight that God has given me as a gift over you. This is a gift. And it is a gift from God. Romans chapter 12. All these are gifts from God. Everything we do for God is a gift. A gift is something that is granted to you, given to you. You don't deserve it. God puts you in a place. You are a gift of God. Peter says, I'm an overseer. I'm an aged Christian. And I am one among you. I am one among you. I'm not greater. I'm not the Pope. I'm not the Pope. I'm a witness of the sufferings of Christ as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed. Are you a partaker of that glory? Amen. Amen. The same glory. Peter writes and he says, to those who have received such faith, the same kind of faith that we have, you have received. You are a recipient of the same grace. And then he tells them to the elders, 
shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight. So that's their role. Their role is to be a shepherd. Now, uh, more specifically for people in the first century, who great majority of them were very poor, were the lowest of the lowest, Paul tells us that. And some of them, in the majority of them, the great majority of them, were illiterate. They were not well-educated people. They were not well-read. They needed somebody to guide them, guide them in the principles of the faith, guide them in the doctrines of the faith. They needed somebody to provide oversight, and that's his role, to shepherd, not under compul compulsion, but willingly. To do this is an honor. To do this is something that should bring us incredible gratitude. That man, you find me worthy to speak to these people, God? You find me worthy to lead these people? You find me worthy for them to even hear me? That's amazing. Not for shameful gain, of course not. And oh man, we got plenty of those in this world, don't we? They're shameless, right? They are shameless. They're all over TV, folks. Give me money and God will give you money. You're a widow, you have nothing left. How much you have in that bank account? $50, empty it and give it to me. Give it to me so I can have my private jet. Give it to me so I can drive my Rolls Royce and have a sports car in every city I land in. Well, the ministry has become so corrupt as we have developed these hierarchies, these kings. We have kings in the church. And what have we done? Scandals after scandals after scandals. How many scandals do you hear of? Anybody hear of uh, this massive church? What was the name of it? Uh, uh, Mars Hills? Mars Hills Church? There's a whole documentary that was put out about uh, you know this church and so many of them. I mean, the old evangelists, all these people who build empires on a name, a man. And they fall. That's not of God, folks. Are we any different than the Reformation, than, than times before the Reformation? No. No. If we start building empires for men and around men, we are just the same. Not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you. Not for shameful gain, but eagerly. Not domineering over those in your charge. You're not a. You're not a dictator. You're not a, a, a an, a, an authority that just you know puts people down and say you follow me. I'm the boss, and you obey me. And if you don't, I will destroy you. Not domineering over those in your charge, but being an example to the flock. There he goes. An example. You are a servant. You serve <clears throat> Jesus Christ. You are a servant. Going back to the book of Ephesians. Ephesians 2 says, None of works. There's no boasting here. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. He gave us the good works, and he gave us an example of how our works should look like. He gave us an example. God did this beforehand, and we should walk in them. How do we walk? As you have received the Lord Jesus Christ, so walk in them. Colossians. For in him are found all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. You want to be great? Learn to be the servant of all. The works are before us. We just need to be servants. Everything we do for God. This brother's going to get up here and sing for Jesus right now. <laughs>